Hey everyone, and welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so happy that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do that is to go onto our Facebook page and like us there. And if you haven't subscribed yet here on YouTube, go ahead and do so now. That way you can keep up with these. With that said, let's get into our next message in our series, Life to the Full. Well, hey, Foundry Church, we're diving in today to the, um, to the idea of life to the full and the fullest enjoyment. And uh, when we look at this idea of fullest enjoyment, we're coming off two weeks of fullest perspective, God's look at life. Then we're coming off of fullest engagement of what it means to really dive into the life of Christ. And now we're looking at fullest enjoyment. We're going to look at the book of Philippians. Now, there's some cool things about this. So we all know who Alexander the Great is, right? You've heard of him. So his dad, Philip, was this incredible Macedonian king. He actually was the first one who his hoplites went up against the king of Persia. Really cool stuff. I mean, so fun and historical. But Philippi is the namesake city for King Philip the father of Alexander the Great. So when we look at the book of Philippians, we understand this city has great historical significance. In our story, it is um, the, the seat of the very first church that the Apostle Paul planted. And so we look at this story and we go, okay, Philippi is the place where the kingdom of God is really planting its first church outside of Jerusalem into the world. And the, the real background on the, on the book of Philippians is this. There's joy. There is joy in this life despite the sufferings and the heartaches and the different things we face. There is joy. So we're going to look at that today and look at what it is it to live. If Jesus said, which he did, I've come to give you life and life to the full, what does it look like to have joy? We all know the song from our childhood. I've kind of forewarned you that I have a solo today. It's not going to be moving in a good way. Um, but I remember the song. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, don't they? Um, yeah, I almost said K. That'd be wrong. Yeah, so you remember that song? I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? And it keeps going on until you finally did, like make the declaration, it's down in my heart. Tuesday. That was good. I went falsetto and I regret it that it was on camera. But you, you have this idea that there is a joy that is abiding and it goes further into your life than your circumstances do. So here's the reality. Looking at our cast of character characters, there are wolves. Scripture speaks of wolves in John 10 that want to steal your, or not, they want to destroy your joy. They want to get in there and destroy your joy. There are thieves and robbers that want to steal your joy. But here's the hope. We can defeat that which comes to unseat our joy, take it away. We actually can resist that. Scripture says it this way. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I remember this. I was uh, a young man, and I was watching two guys, like, backyard brawl of my middle school days. They both doubled up their fists, and they were like this. And one kid hauled off and just tattooed. The other guy was like, oh! You know, I thought his face would be a different shape when he pulled away. And that kid who got punched smiled at the other kid, and you were like, Oh, buddy, you're in a world of hurt, right? He had this weird, he shouldn't have been smiling at that point, but it kind of broke the, the mentality of the guy who had come against him. And that dude was like, look, I'm sorry, and he backed away from the fight. 
He lost the fight without taking a punch. And I look at this and I go, there's something in us about that. Satan throws his best punches on us, but the joy of the Lord is our ability to endure hardship, suffering, and the good things of this life with an abiding and unbroken sense of joy. God did not create you, and this is important that you get this, for a rigid, boring, always serious, bitter life. Now, don't get me wrong, there's bitterness in this life at times, but there is an abiding joy that gives you life to the full that comes only from God. Remember, I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. It's down in my heart to stay. Um, so here's the thing. There should be some joy in our life, but here's, let's break it into areas where it should be. There, the First of all, there should be joy in my walk with the Lord. There should be a joy in my walk with the Lord. Here's what the Apostle Paul said of this thought. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians says it this way, for me to live is, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Doesn't that seem a little backwards? To live is Christ. It is to live a life of servitude and submission. But to die is gain. It's actually better that I would be, well, not here. And when you think of that, you think, what a sad thing, unless you look at the person who's saying it. The Apostle Paul, who hated the early church, he put to death and imprisoned members of the early church. And then he met Jesus, and he found not a need to stand up and fight for the gospel, he found a fight for his faith, but he found something worth serving. He found a joy in being in a relationship with Christ that made death even better than this life. He wasn't held by his circumstances. The person who could say this is the Apostle Paul who loved Jesus more than he did all the benefits of this life. And when we look at him, we can understand that the joy of the Lord, indeed it was his strength. It was his his living kind of badge of honor that he was joyful in all circumstances, which tells us this, there should be joy in our walk with the Lord. And there should be joy in our walk with the Lord versus anxiety. Anxiety tells you you have something to lose. Joy says you have something that can never be taken from you. And that's a really important reality. Joy says what the devil may do to us physically is a real thing, but what he can never take from us is the promise of Christ in our lives. So here's how we know this. In downtown Rome, well, downtown, uh, it's uh, the ancient downtown part of the Forum. It was right by Constantine's Arch in Rome was this place called the Mamertinium Prison. And it's this this dank cellar, kind of looks like a silo dug into the ground. And that's where the Apostle Paul wrote this letter from. He said that there is joy in all circumstances, and he was in the worst possible circumstances. He was in prison under the psychotic rule of the Emperor Nero. There were people out there in the world trying to compete with him on like religious grounds. They were trying to, uh, they were mocking him and deriding him if they were Jews. They were competing with him as church planters. There were a lot of churches that just flat out needed him. There were people trying to get him in a lot of trouble. Remember, the apostle Paul was flogged almost to death multiple times because Paul let God direct his steps, but he also let God carry his burdens. And when we look at this, we can understand that God, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord in our walk with him outweighs the burdens of our anxieties. The what about tomorrows? How will I survive today? The Apostle Paul tells us that in any circumstance, our walk with the Lord should provide a joy that supersedes our circumstances. I want to take a minute and read a scripture. It's, um, it's out of Philippians, and uh, it's Philippians 4, 5, and 7, and it says this. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. Let's just stop right there. I would love for us to be able to just kind of mind dump right now all the situations we faced just this morning, the different individuals in here, right? How many weird situations have you faced? And it says, but in every situation, so maybe some of us were late to work, right? 
You, maybe you were late to work. Maybe you were sick. Maybe your kids woke up and puked. Maybe, um, maybe something has gone wrong. Maybe there's sickness. Maybe there's frustration. Maybe there's a job issue. I don't know, but maybe you woke up with a situation brewing on your mind. What the Apostle Paul says, the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. With thanksgiving, And it tells us this, the enemy will constantly plague our minds with all that hasn't worked out well, all that we failed to do. He will remind us time and again of all the ways you and I are a bit of a dumpster fire of humanity. But what Paul says is present every situation to God with thanksgiving, which means look up for a minute and see more than the things that plague you. Look at the good things in your life. Everybody has something worth being thankful for. And we can pause and we can be thankful and then we can present our request to God. But I love this scripture. It goes on to say, and the peace of God, which transcends and goes beyond all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. It will guard your mind. But there is a physical posture of thanksgiving that we must take in order for that guardianship to be true. God will guard our mind. He will be our shield. But at some point with thanksgiving, we have to take it up and kind of hold up against it. And I'll be honest, I have to do this. Had to do this right before I came out here today to teach. I have to do this. My circumstances can get in my head and scramble my brain. Mess up my emotions, cause me to be anxious, but the joy of the Lord in my relationship with him has to outweigh my anxieties, and I have to be willing to pause and give thanks for who he is, regardless of my circumstances. But there's also a joy in the Lord that takes place within our relationships, the joy in my relationships. And the reality of this is that we as people who live in interconnected relationships, quite often we lose joy, and we're going to talk about how that happens. I'd like to read this scripture out of Philippians 2, 1 through 5. Just kind of share it with you, and then we'll unpack this. This is what it says. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing of the Spirit, if there's any tenderness, any compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Catch this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others each of you to the interest of others. But then there's this little pivot that happens. It might be Paul's greatest theological moment, what, he just, what he's about to do. What we're about to read is probably one of the most pivotal um, early declarations of Christ to the church. It says this, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Then listen to these words that come out of verse 6 through 11. Who, so have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But rather he made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and found in the appearance of a man. as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But the mindset of Jesus is what set him up for that exaltation. He humbled himself. He got himself into a different mindset. And we live in a culture that does not value laying down life for one another, laying down things. You never see a football player, a baseball player, hockey, basketball, whatever, if they do something amazing, they always stop and kind of showboat themselves. How great would it be if a running back dropped the ball and ran back and stood next to, next to the offensive line and went, these guys, these guys are the reason that just happened. We'd be like, oh, I like that guy. I like that guy. He's humbled himself and knows without those workhorses in front of him, he never gets anywhere. 
He humbled himself. But here's the thing. Jesus Christ is our example in this. And there is a joy in what he did that goes beyond what we can imagine. It says that Jesus Christ came, the very first word of creation, the co-eternal son of God, became a human, dependent on a young lady for his nutrition and his life. She, she raised him up. Then he gave his life, was mocked, scourged, and crucified. He rose from the dead, but he laid down everything. He took on the role of servant. And because of his ability to do that, he was exalted. And the reality for you and I is this. We will find joy when we pour into other lives. But we will never, ever experience the satisfaction of joy if we only feed our own insatiable appetites. If we only feed our own insatiable appetites, there will never be joy. So the reality is there must be joy in our relationships versus our desire for our own selfish things, the things we want. We have to make a choice. There is an opportunity cost, and if we want to be joyful, there will mean a denial of self and something for a greater good, for a greater calling. And it will cost you personally and emotionally, but the joy in your relationships versus selfishness is, well, it's described by the Apostle Paul continuing on in Philippians 2 here. It says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone else looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Here's where we really get into it. And this is where I think maybe, you know, picturing like a a bit of a cat fight here, the fur is going to fly for us because we have deeply selfish, um, uh, just a nature. We have a self-centered nature. And what we find in this is that the world has an MO to it. It has this modus operandi that says, I'm going to look out for number one. After me, you're first. That's always the mentality. That's always a mentality. I was in a grocery store the other day, and um, I had like six things, and I was, I was at Aldi, and I'm holding this because I wasn't paying a quarter from a cart. And um, I'm holding it, and uh, a guy comes up, and he's carrying like a jug of milk and a thing of eggs. And the lady in front of me says to him, you only have a couple things. Go ahead. And I'm like, well, what do I have? I was super mad. I was like, I'm sorry. I think six could be a couple. Right? I, I, was, I was a little ticked off, and I'm like, not only were you generous with your spot, you were generous with mine. Get behind me, sir. And I was, I was so irritated. But I had to do the nice thing. Uh, it's fine. And I stood there, and I was like, I want to throw all my food at this person who stole my spot. I literally, I was like, why does he get to go ahead of me? How could this happen to me? And I lost all perspective, all perspective. You are told in this culture, get what you want and get it first. The enemy tricks us into into this thinking that self-absorption, self-centeredness is a necessity for survival and happiness. And the weird thing is, when I think of selfish people, when I think of the most selfish people I've ever known, they are the most miserable misers on earth. They have everything and enjoy nothing. They have everything and enjoy nothing. It is a lie of the devil if we believe that after me, you're first. Because we must know that we will become selfish, emotional, spiritual misers who are generous with nothing if we don't allow the Lord to give us a joy in our relationships, a fullness of joy in our relationships. That costs us personally. We can't be selfish in who we are. And we have to understand the role that this plays in our life. Satan's goal is your destruction, and he doesn't care if you are destroyed from the outside in or the inside out. And I will tell you this, selfishness begins as a little darkness in your own heart, and it begins to demand more, and it becomes entitled, and it becomes angry, and it becomes bitter. And by the end, you're standing up, and you hate people who have what you want. And selfishness consumes you from the inside out. He doesn't care how you're destroyed. From the inside out, it's just fine with Satan. So be careful of selfishness. It says this in the scripture. 
Everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. They look out for their interests, not Jesus' interests. Here's what I have to look at in this verse. It's not only telling us that we have to be different than the world, but and, and really fight that, that desire, combat that need to, to be held on by what we are consumed with, what, what we want most right now. Our selfish desires have to die, yes. But it's, it's saying something else about who we are and what's really important. And it asks this question, whose interests are we supposed to be looking out for? In our current cultural climate in this world, we would say we should be looking out for the interests of the broken, the hurting, the needy. And I would say, yeah, those are decent things, but that's not who we're supposed to be looking out for in terms of our interests. We are to be consumed with the interest of Jesus Christ. He knows, remember his big perspective, he knows what they need far more than we do. If we're consumed with the interest of Jesus Christ, his interests They will free us to do what he would desire for them. And they will meet in some way Jesus Christ through our lives. We have to understand that living with the interest of Jesus Christ is paramount, removes from us the selfishness that seeks to consume us from the inside out. And it frees us from other people's demands. Selfishness can often come through our need to meet other people's demands. And it frees us from that. There should be joy in your work. I love, I mean, not always, but I love work. I could do, I have to put boundaries on my life to not work. At night, different things like that. Last night I was thinking about some stuff. I had to turn my phone off and set it down. I'm like, I'm not doing it. Right? There should be joy in work. It shouldn't own everything, but there should be joy in it. And Paul speaks to this. He says it this way. Philippians 2, 14, 15. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Do you think that's possible, that you can do everything without grumbling and complaining and end up shining like stars in the sky? I believe that our work is something we are wired to do. There was always work in the Bible. Work is not a result of the, of the fall of humanity. We didn't have to work because Adam sinned. Adam had a job. He was the first farmer in the Garden of Eden. There was always work. There'll always be something purposefully to put our hand to. He had a job to do. Work can be a wonderful part of life to the full when we find our purpose in Christ. I have seen joyful Christians doing things that seem awful to you and I, doing things that would make us think, like, that is horrible. There was a pastor in Africa who was working so hard, and it didn't shame me like, oh, I'm a bad person. But I just looked at him, I'm like, look at the joy in that dude's life. Pastor Oliver, just my mind is blown by him. He dropped his phone into a long drop. It's the bathroom of the bush, right? And it's a long drop to a bad place. And he's like, yeah, I dropped my phone. We cleaned it off, to which I'm like, what? You're still using it? I think he got pinkier from it. Like, oh, so gross. But they cleaned it up, and he's like, "Eh, it happens. But look how many people are coming to Jesus. His heart was on the right things. I have seen joyful Christians doing things that we would think is terrible. Like you're watching people digging in the heat, like out there just working, getting no pay, nothing, just serving, and it brings them joy. I've seen people cooking meals at ghastly hours of the morning for work teams to go out and share the gospel in villages and hill tribes, and they do it with great joy. I've seen it done here in this church. I've come in early in the morning or late at night to find someone cleaning the bathrooms or taking care of the facility. It happens all the time. Make that your goal, that you serve in every moment with the joy of the work you were given. Serve every moment with that. And when you stop giving voice to the grumbling, I'm better than cleaning this toilet, I'm better than this or that, we'll find ourselves, instead of thinking we're better than that, we'll feel honored for the place we are called to serve in the kingdom of God. And after a while, you'll see not only have you had a change of heart, 
but the world around you is somehow being blessed and the kingdom is growing through your basic, everyday, ordinary service. But we have to look at joy versus laziness. There's a joy in our work and it competes against our own instinctive laziness. It says this in Philippians 3, 18 and 19. For as I have, as I have often told you before and tell you again with tears, Many live as enemies to the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set only on the things of this earth. Think about that. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, their glory, their shame. Look at the alternative to having joy in your work. If you're only doing things to feed your insatiable appetites, Grumbling and complaining at everything, arguing with anyone who asks help or assistance or participation from you. If you serve your whims, your emotions, and your circumstantial faith, you literally are living the the story out of the wolf and the knife covered in blood. You are eating your own destruction. It's not full of enjoyment. There's no life in the grumbling and complaining and anger that goes on there. You're eating and taking in your own destruction. You're glorying in something that is actually to your shame. We as the church have to understand that that kind of attitude is devastating to the witness of our faith in the community and in the greater, in the community of the church and in the greater community of the world. So we have to understand that there is a call to joy in the work we do, and it must push back against our laziness and self-serving desires. And finally, there is joy in rest and play. There is joy in having fun. I mean, from I, this part of the world is like um, cottage country, jet skis, dune toys, things like that. I love when Michigan comes awake in the summer. Everybody's so excited to go and do things. They're, they're excited to play so hard they really truly need rest. I love that. I think there should be joy in our rest and our play. I think it should be a healthy part of our lives. The Apostle Paul would agree with that when he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, and whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. Whatever you have learned or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Here's what we know. You can have fun. One of our values in the Foundry Church is seriously fun. We take the gospel serious. We never take ourselves seriously. We have a hoot. We have a, a hoot. I felt like a little old person there. We're out just having a hoot. Um, we, we have a really good time. Seriously fun. We actually enjoy. I have a trophy on my desk where, where I defeated other members of staff, and it serves as a reminder of the averageness of my golf game and the subparness of theirs. And I'm like, yes, I love. we have fun. We mock each other. We heckle. We laugh a lot. A lot of people say here at the church, I have to leave to get my work done. It's a lot of fun. We're seriously fun. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. My question for you and my drive towards this is um, turn your heart towards these things. When you've lived into your work, into your purpose in these different things, have joy in your rest and play. Experience life to the full and joy to the full. It's not always something bad to enjoy your rest, to go away and do something, to be dedicated to family and friends and gathering and enjoying it. Being palms up, we say, you know, in palms up in the church, that's our posture. God removes things. But God sometimes puts some really good things in too. There's some really good things that go on in our life and they add to the joy, the rest, and the play we do. Don't think that to be a Christian, you have to be this sour, sad you know, like never have any fun kind of person. Enjoy this life. Jesus always found time for quiet, rest, and prayer. I love there's a picture of Jesus, like somebody just painted a portrait, and um, it's of him laughing, and I just love that. I identify with that. I wonder what it would have been like when he really cracked up when somebody said something funny. And we think to ourselves, like, is this how it's supposed to be, or are we supposed to be sour and kind of downcast? We need to understand our joy in rest and play needs to push back against this idea of false guilt. 
So when we look at this idea of, of joy and rest and play, pushing back against a false guilt that says, you probably shouldn't be doing that. There's important you know, kingdom work to do. Some of the best kingdom work I've ever seen happen has happened in really good times, really enjoying life together. Paul says it this way in Philippians 3, 1 to 2, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard to you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the, of the flesh. Sounds pretty, right? But you know what the mutilators of the flesh were? They were giving no rest to the new Gentile converts. To the Greeks who were coming to Christ, they were giving no rest. They were Jews who came in and said, okay, you can be a Christian, and that's fine. But in order to be a Christian, you have to be circumcised. You have to do this set of rules to, um, to, for things to go right for you, for you to be a Christian. They, they set things up, and people who create false rules and laws, they do it, well, because it allows them to control the environment. You know, like maybe you remember this when you were little, you couldn't like, you can go outside on a Sunday afternoon, but you can't run and laugh. Anybody have weird rules like that? You can go, you can go in the pool, but you can't get your hair wet, right? You can get in the pool, but you have to stay in a nicer set of clothes and you can't splash. Because that's in Scripture, right? I mean, we think about it and we're like, oh, this is weird. Now, there's nothing wrong with a day set apart to rest. But the reality is people who create false rules and laws do it because it is what they want, not what God wants. Don't fall into their traps. If your boss takes a day off um, yeah, or never takes a day off, you don't have to copy them. Take a day off. Enjoy life. Spend time with the people who matter. Don't feel like you have to compete with your sister-in-law who somehow with four homeschooled children has never had a messy house. You don't have to fight it. You don't have to compare yourself and say, I'm not as good a person as her. No. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how she'd pull that off, but hey, congrats, sis, right? There's bigger fish to fry in this life than living up to other people's standards. um, So here's the thing. Maybe you don't love cottages, and Silver Lake, and sea and boats and stuff, but you really like baseball games, please go to baseball games with your family. Please go do that. I know this. My wife and our kids, we love travel. We love to travel. So we don't have boats and jet skis and different toys. Nothing wrong with them. I think they're, once again, a hoot. But here's the thing. We have chosen that. I'm not ashamed of it. I think it's awesome. I like to go to big cities, get lost, find our way out and be like, oh man, that was great. I love it. I love that kind of stuff. I love traveling. We love it so much. It's important to us, but you don't have to love it. It can't be like, oh no, I can't go to the foundry. I hate cities. That's not the way this works. Other people might find going to unfamiliar places very unsettling. So here's the thing, don't live in false guilt. False guilt robs, steals, and destroys the joy of things you might really, the joy you could have in certain things because, well, they don't like it. Who cares? Don't live under false guilt of really enjoying rest and play. And don't feel like you have to do it on the standards of other people. I'll close with this thought. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. This world will come against you in a million different ways. The joy of the Lord is an unbreakable bulwark that will uphold you in the hardest times. Doesn't always feel great, but there are times where it's just, well, it's the joy of knowing Christ, of knowing that your circumstances don't write the ending. The joy of the Lord. I invite you, as you go into the tornado that is this coming week, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. May it guard you and protect you both before and behind. May you experience the joy of the Lord. In life to the full, may you experience the fullness of the joy of God in the week you're about to go into. Pray with me. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the different facets in which joy fits into our life. From our relationships to our work to our rest, our play, and our purpose and mission and identity in Christ. Thank you for that. 
God, we love you and give you praise for who you are and the way you're working in this church, in our hearts, in our lives. And we ask, come now and give us a reminder of that joy, the joy of our salvation and the hope in the future that we have only because of your love for us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive this benediction. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he, Christ, may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, and it may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long, how high and how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the full measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to, to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in Christ and in the church, both now and forever. Amen. Friends, bless you as you go about your week. Hey, thanks again for joining us for this week's message. If you're looking to prepare yourself for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description and that'll take you to our weekly devotions page. Devotions are a crucial part of our weekly rhythm here at The Foundry. We really hope that God spoke something powerful into your life today, and we hope that you'll join us again next week.